Hi folks, this is uh, Sunday the 22nd of March uh, 2020. Unfortunately, we can't meet as a, a church and I know many people will be missing that, uh, missing the fellowship, catching up with each other and um, that's a special part of who we are as a church family at Kamiles. So that's the downside of everything. But listen, on the upside, at least, uh, unlike um, during the sermon, you can pause me at any time, go make a cup of tea, you can uh, turn me down or turn me off if necessary. But I hope you don't. And I've tried to keep this message as brief as possible um, so that it might give you just something to think about, uh, hopefully something to uh, encourage you. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, it's just something that we you can uh, chew over and, uh, in the coming days. Uh, we will also uh, keep up to date with you on this uh, channel um, using uh, other means. Uh, there'll be children's addresses and various other things over the coming weeks probably. Um, but this is a message that I want to share with you today and it's a message um, that I've called How did we go from paradise to hoarding rice and beans? Firstly, let me share with you the words of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. On February the 19th, Zach Endler and more than a dozen other people set out on a 25-day adventure, rafting the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. When they left, Bernie Sanders had a double-digit lead heading into that night's Democratic debate in Las Vegas. Cases of coronavirus were showing signs of decline in mainland China. On March the 14th, when they pulled their rafts out of the river, a man who worked for a rafting company asked them, Have you been in contact with the outside world? They had not. Except for a few one-way text messages sent to their families on a satellite phone, they had not heard anything in more than three weeks. No cell service or news, not even a passing word from fellow travellers. Then the man told them what they didn't know. Coronavirus had exploded in the US and around the world. Italy was under lockdown, the stock market was plummeting. Professional sports were suspended, many schools were closed. Tom Hanks had the virus. Edler said, half of us thought he was joking. It's like, here's an old river guide pulling our leg. I mean, I've heard some pretty big tales out in the river. The group packed up their rafts and gear and drove out. 90 minutes later, they picked up a cell signal and the texts poured in. It was this feeling of disbelief, Ms. Nack said. It's like, how do we go from paradise to hoarding rice and beans. I guess we were all asking ourselves a similar question. How did we get here exactly? How did it come to this? Cast your mind back a few months just uh, before the new year. Folks asking you, I wonder what 2020 will bring? Uh, with excitement in their voices. Anticipation. Few, if any of us, would have expected that mid-March we would be where we are and even those of us who have been following the coronavirus story since it began in late 2019 in Wuhan in China have still been taken somewhat unawares by the rapidly unfolding events that have changed so changed our lives temporarily and in some aspects no doubt permanently. The only thing that I can compare it to is having been in a car accident where you see the events unfolding in slow motion almost all around you, but you're powerless to change it. And you're at a loss to fully understand it. These events have largely crept up on us and swiftly then overtaken us. And no, it's not what we expected. How could we have? But then life is full of unexpected events, isn't it? Twists and turns, ups and downs. Our expectations are confounded almost all the time. 
things are rarely as good as we imagine that they'll be. But then it's true too that our worst expectations often turn out to be very different from the dark thoughts that our minds conjure up. What really, what really can we truly expect in this life? Would it be right to have a realistic expectation of good health throughout a long life? Have we an expectation of meeting our true love perhaps and living happily ever after? Have we an expectation of wealth, comfort, a good job for life? Do we expect a life lived out in a land of undisturbed peace and security at all times? If we start out with any or all of these expectations in mind, it often doesn't take long for our bubble to be burst. For the reality of living in a fallen world, a broken world, to sweep away our expectations. Does the Bible promise any or all of these things? Does it promise us a life without strife, days without disturbance? Well, no, it doesn't. Indeed, the very opposite is true. You can realistically, the Bible tells us, expect uh, trouble, trials, persecution and poverty. Especially, the Bible says, if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you might say, and yet the story starts in the Garden of Eden, doesn't it? Where there was no death. There was no suffering. No poverty. No hunger. No job losses. No heartbreak. And certainly no vicious viruses to turn our lives upside down. Where did it go so wrong? How do we go from paradise to hoarding rice and beans? Well, of course, the Bible tells us how and, and why that happens. It tells us that we deliberately chose this path over paradise. And now we all walk it together, folks. Together. And that's the word that often people seem to forget. Suffering, sorrow, fear, anxiety. It's our shared human vocabulary. Sin is one virus that we will never develop immunity from. So is this all there is, you might say? Is this all you have for us, Minister? I, I'm miserable enough when I uh, flick through my, my Twitter feed or, or turn on my television to watch the BBC News without listening to this, you might say. Is this all that we can expect then? Well, no, it's not. And here's the good news, it's not. Because the Bible tells us that we can expect so much more and we can expect so much better. And indeed we have the promise of so much better and so much more. But only when we place our trust, not in the things of this world and what it has to offer, but in Jesus Christ. Not in how much we have stored in our barns or our cupboards, but in the riches that we've stored up in heaven. But I think we'll leave that thought for another day. Let me just finish with the word of God again, this time from Romans 8. This is a familiar passage, I'm sure to many. But it's one that I find often very encouraging and helpful. It's entitled in the NIV, More Than Conquerors, from verse 31 of Romans 8. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or a sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, 
neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.